We've heard a lot today about the current uh, financial crisis and its impacts, and uh, we thought it would be a good idea to conclude today's session with some information about another financial crisis, um, which happened in Japan. And here to talk to you about that is William Tsutsui, who is a professor of history and the associate dean for international studies in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Kansas University. His research focuses on the business, environmental, and cultural history of 20th century Japan. He is the author of Banking Policy in Japan, Manufacturing Ideology, Scientific Management in 20th Century Japan, and Godzilla on My Mind, which is my personal favorite. His current projects include studies of the environmental impact of World War II on Japan, the globalization of Japanese popular culture, and sports in Japanese history. Tsutsui has been a faculty fellow at Kansas University's Center for Teaching Excellence, and he received a 2001 William T. Kemper Award for Teaching Excellence, and he's won Kansas University's Steeples Faculty Award for service to the people of Kansas and the Woodyard International Educa Ed Educator Award. So please join me in welcoming, I did it again. No, I did it right this time. <laughs> Let's all welcome Bill Tsutsui. <laughs> Well, thank you um, for having me here today. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk with you. And while Chicago is plenty hot, it's at least 10 degrees cooler than Kansas City. <laughs> now, it's tough uh, being the last speaker uh, in a three-day uh, like this, probably worse for you than for me, uh, honestly, since you've been taking in a lot of information, I'm sure and must be a little bit saturated, not to mention exhausted, uh, by this point in the schedule. It's also tough, I think, having your workshop end up with a discussion of the recent Japanese economic experience. As many of you know, I think, Japan is currently being held up as the nightmare version of what might happen if the U.S. government can't get a handle on our current economic crisis. In other words, Japan seems to be an example of what we don't want to do and what we don't want to become. So unfortunately, you won't be ending off today with an upbeat, rosy story. The history of the Japanese economy, not to mention Japanese politics and society over the past 20 years, is something of a downer. And it's hard not to be pessimistic about Japan's future. But our goal today is to learn not to have a feel-good experience about our retirement accounts and the future of the global economy. And there certainly is a great deal we can learn from a case study of Japan in boom and bust. Now, my basic plan for this afternoon is pretty simple. First, um, I'll give you a basic picture of the post-war Japanese economy, what is known as the miracle economy, and the industrial, financial, and political system that carried Japan from post-war impoverishment to being the second largest economy in the world over the span of less than 50 years. Then we'll talk about the bubble economy of the late 1980s in Japan, what caused it, what sustained it, and what impact it had on Japanese society. Then we'll talk about the bust that started in 1990 and the long period of economic stagnation, political drift, and social crisis that followed it, now usually referred to as the lost decade. Finally, I'll uh, discuss a couple important questions uh, that I think we need to get a handle on today. One is, what did the Japanese do wrong? Why haven't they been able to get out of their ongoing possibly endless economic hole. And the other one is pretty much the $64,000 question. What lessons does the Japanese experience hold for us in the United States today? Put simply, how do we avoid becoming Japan? Now, as we go along here, please feel free to jump in if something doesn't make sense or if you have an immediate question, but I think we will have a lot of time at the end for discussion uh, as well. So let's start off by going back to 1945. At the end of World War II, Japan was almost literally bombed back to the Stone Age. Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been obliterated by atomic bombs, and almost all of the other major Japanese cities, including Tokyo, had been flattened in American air raids. <laughs> 
When the war ended, Japan looked like a basket case economically. Unemployment was sky high. Inflation was raging at triple-digit levels. Food was in short supply. The raw materials necessary for industry were not available. In any case, most factories, as well as more than half of the nation's housing stock, had been taken out of action by American bombing. Agricultural production was slumping, and the overseas markets for Japan's exports had all been lost in the defeat. Not surprisingly, many experts in the American occupation forces that rolled into Tokyo in 1945 felt that Japan should just give up on having a modern economy altogether. Its industries should be scrapped, some argued, and Japan should prepare for a future of, subs of subsistence agriculture. For all this pessimism in the ruins of war, Japan actually had quite a bit going for it economically in 1945. Well-educated, diligent workers, experience with modern industrial production, a serviceable financial and transportation infrastructure, and perhaps most importantly, a populace and a government absolutely committed to building the nation economically once again. The situation was stabilized during the American occupation, which lasted up to 1952. And although recovery was slow and painful at first, by the 1950s, the Japanese economy appeared to be back on track. The Korean War was an important catalyst. U.S. military procurements pulled the Japanese, out, Japanese economy out of its post-war funk and gave much needed impetus to the manufacturing sector. Japan's re-entry into international trade proceeded smoothly, largely under American sponsorship, and many of the overseas markets lost during World War II were progressively regained. Investment in new productive capacity and the introduction of the latest technology from the West, such as the now infamous case of the transistor licensed for a song from America's Bell Labs to Sony, proceeded briskly. By 1954, Japan had clawed its way back to pre-war levels of economic activity. In 1956, one government economic report boldly declared that, quote, the post-war period is over. In the latter half of the 1950s, Japanese national income grew at an average rate of 9.1% a year. And by the 1960s, the real heyday of what became known as the miracle economy, annual growth averaged well over 10%. Although such figures have now become commonplace in rapidly industrializing nations like China, the speed and duration of post-war Japan's economic expansion was unprecedented economically, internationally at the time. Now, many elements contributed to what is often called Japan's high-growth economy of the 1950s and 1960s. And let's just make a brief list uh, of some of the factors that scholars have identified as being important uh, to this uh, rapid uh, expansion. Well, first of all, some scholars have stressed the importance of Japan's international trade policy. Uh, this idea that the Japanese protected their home markets uh, while waging economic war abroad, launching uh, vigorous export drives. Others have pointed to Japan's human resources, those well-trained, diligent workers I mentioned a moment ago, uh, that's able managers, it's cooperative unionists. And a few have accused the Japanese of getting a free ride on the path to prosperity, essentially because America picked up the bill for Japanese defense uh, during the hottest days of the Cold War. In essence, Japan uh, harbored under the U.S. nuclear umbrella during the Cold War and spent a very, uh, very small percentage uh, of its own money uh, on its defense. A number of uh, scholars have also pointed uh, to the open world trading system after World War II as an important component of Japan's success. In essence, Japan uh, was able to take advantage uh, of, uh, of the free trade regime to sell its products abroad and have easy access to the resources it need, needed. Of course, Japan has no uh, petroleum reserves, so it had to import all of its uh, oil uh, and many of its other raw materials. And this open world trading system uh, facilitated that process. <clears throat> 
Entrepreneurship and corporate leadership also need to be mentioned. Um, although traditionally Japan has not been thought of as a terribly entrepreneurial company, uh, country, uh, in fact, uh, comparative studies often show it to be one of the least entrepreneurial countries uh, in the world. Uh, in fact, the record uh, of Japanese firms since World War II is very strong. Uh, and these entrepreneurial firms include household names like Sony, uh, Honda, uh, and Nintendo. Uh, and this energy of innovation uh, uh, and entrepreneurship uh, really helped build the Japanese economy. In recent years, uh, many uh, economists have finally begun to acknowledge what may actually have been one of the most important factors in Japan's economic boom of the 1950s and 1960s. While the Japanese are usually depicted as some of the world's greatest savers, they have also proven to be some of the world's foremost spenders. And this was never more true than in the decades immediately after World War II, when Japan's consumers, apparently compensating for the hardships and deprivations of the war years, bought at an unprecedented pace. Uh, and so uh, if you go back and look, and really, uh, though we in America often believe Japan has been an export-driven economy, during those years of very rapid economic growth, a great deal of it, a majority of it, came from domestic consumption uh, and domestic investment. Now, much scholarly attention has been given to the role of the government bureaucracy in Japan's high-growth economy. Um, state industrial policy, as it was called, charted largely within the Ministry of International Trade and Industry and carried out cooperatively with major corporations, provided a strategic plan and central guidance for Japan's economic rise. Uh, the scholar who really um, introduced this idea and has been uh, its main proponent is someone named Chalmers Johnson, who described Japan as a developmental state. Uh, really a prototype of the kind of government that we've seen uh, more recently in high growth economies uh, in places like Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, and even China. Uh, the basic idea here is that the government did not just sit back uh, and watch the economy grow or regulate uh, business during the miracle economy years. It really was like the general in the economic playing field, uh, helping to coordinate and lead the economy uh, and in private industry uh, in certain ways to maximize uh, the nation's economic growth. Many scholars uh, have also placed a great deal of emphasis on the unique structural features of the Japanese economy uh, during uh, the high growth era. Uh, essentially, distinctive ways uh, of doing things uh, in Japan, like industrial policy, that ended up supporting uh, rapid economic growth. Uh, the first of these uh, that has been widely identified is the Japanese employment system. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this concept of permanent employment. In Japan, the traditional model is that when you graduated from high school or college, uh, you would be recruited by a firm and then work for that one firm until retirement age. Uh, so from 18 or uh, 21 uh, until uh, your mid-50s, when there's a tradition, when there's a tra traditional retirement age in Japan. Uh, once you entered that firm, uh, you would be uh, constantly promoted upwards and your salary would rise based on seniority. Uh, so you'd be carried along in sort of an escalator uh, in that company until uh, you retired. Uh, and this, of course, uh, was considered to be a very good deal uh, for Japanese workers. They had complete job security. Uh, they had a guarantee of rising incomes uh, and increasing influence uh, within the firm. And in return, uh, one of the things that the workers gave uh, was uh, they essentially uh, – ceded any kind of political role in the company to their bosses. Uh, company unions uh, became the norm. So labor uh, cooperated with management and generally had uh, a very friendly relationship with management rather than an antagonistic one. Uh, so the outcome of this was you had a very content workforce, you had very little uh, labor unrest uh, in Japan, and you had a workforce that became a very good source of investment. Because you were going to keep these workers and they were working for you their entire career, uh, things like training uh, became very good payoffs uh, for Japanese companies. The Keiretsu system uh, is another uh, aspect of the post-war Japanese economy. Keiretsu, uh, the best way to translate it is something like conglomerates. Uh, 
uh, really these were financial groupings of Japanese corporations after World War II. Uh, and they were generally organized around large banks. Uh, and each large bank would have a constellation of firms associated with it. Uh, and these firms uh, would span the industries. So there might be an uh, insurance company, there might be an auto manufacturer, there might be an electronics firm, a shipping firm, a trading company, and so forth. And these companies were all tied together by interlocking directorates, by shared stock holdings, uh, and uh, informally supported each other uh, financially, managerially, uh, and uh, through purchase of each other's products uh, to build themselves. Uh, and this is really a legacy of a pre-war structure uh, in Japan uh, where there were very, very large conglomerates in Japanese society uh, that had banded together uh, really to uh, concentrate financial assets at a time when there wasn't a lot of capital in Japan. Uh, this persisted, though, uh, after World War II and became one of the distinctive features of the Japanese economy. And we see this in other Asian economies as well, most famously, of course, South Korea, where there are very similar kind of industrial financial groupings uh, in place uh, today. This Keiretsu system then relates to the system of corporate finance and banking, uh, which we saw in post-war Japan. Essentially, through much of the post-war period, the stock and bond markets in Japan were not used widely to raise funds for corporations. Instead, when a company needed capital to, make, to invest in new uh, plant and equipment, they would not go to the equity markets, they would go to the bank in their keiretsu, and they would obtain bank loans to make the investments they needed. Okay. Now, the system gave tremendous power to banks, needless to say, because they were the ones injecting the capital into the system. It also gave tremendous power to the state, and this is largely the way in which industrial policy was manipulated in Japan, because as banks controlled the flow of capital to manufacturing firms, so the state uh, controlled the flow of funds to banks uh, and influenced the way banks allocated those funds. Okay. So as opposed to a more market-oriented structure uh, where firms would go to the, the equity markets, raise capital and invest it, and therefore be a little bit further for outside the control of the government, because of this bank-centered financing model, banks had a lot of influence and the government had a lot of influence about the way the economy moved. The dual economy... Um, I'll just mention this briefly. This is the notion uh, in post-war Japan that uh, really one sees a very uh, severe split in the economy between large modern corporations using the latest technology, high levels of labor productivity, and a sea of smaller mom-and-pop operations, small and mid-sized companies that are using largely outdated technology, have lower levels of labor productivity, uh, and generally uh, not the kind uh, of sophisticated managerial systems uh, or financial systems that we see in larger enterprises. So we saw really a two-tier system uh, in Japan of large, modern, world-class enterprises, and then this sea of smaller enterprises that supply them, and largely they're also involved in the distribution uh, and uh, retail sides of the market in Japan. Japanese-style management, uh, I mean, uh, it, it hit U.S. education as hard as it did Toyota or Nissan, I think. Quality control circles, just-in-time manufacturing, uh, zero defects, a very inclusive worker-centered system, it was said, uh, very uh, highly uh, imported to the United States uh, from the 1980s on. And then finally, and in some ways uh, uh, most importantly, uh, the Japanese political system. Uh, that underlay rapid economic growth. Japan, from the 1950s to the 1990s, and some would say uh, up to today, has essentially been a one-party state. Uh, the Liberal Democratic Party, the LDP, uh, which the joke goes is neither very liberal nor very democratic, uh, has controlled the nation uh, electorally through virtually the entire post-war period. This is very much the conservative, pro-business party in Japan. Its electoral base is in the countryside, uh, and it has had a lock uh, on the bureaucracy and on political power uh, since, uh, since the 1950s.
Finally then, in terms of these unique structural features, an often overlooked element is the social consensus that supported economic growth. The Japanese people, you need to understand, bought into the idea of growth in GDP as the prime goal of post-war Japan, and they were willing to make real sacrifices to attain this goal. So they were willing to work extremely hard, to put up with poor housing conditions, to put up with uh, negative effects of industrialization like high pollution, to tolerate an unresponsive political system in the LDP, and so forth, in order that the nation could succeed. Okay. So people often talk in the post-war period about rich Japan, poor Japanese. The Japanese so bought into this image of Japan becoming a major leading power in the world, uh, uh, they so bought into the uh, main yardstick of success being growth in GDP, that in many ways they sacrificed uh, their own individual interests for this collective goal. Now, pride ran high in Japan when the nation's post-war achievements, from the rebuilding of war-scarred cities to technological marvels like the Shinkansen bullet train, were showcased to the international community at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics and Expo 70 held in Osaka. Yet despite swelling material wealth and national confidence, Japan's 20-year run of unabated economic expansion came to an abrupt and unsettling halt in the early 1970s. The OPEC oil embargo of 1973 to 74, known in Japan as the oil shock, brought the high-flying but hydrocarbon poor Japanese economy back to earth with a jolt. Seemingly overnight, falling oil supplies and exploding energy prices spurred intense inflation and meant the end of positive economic growth. The first industrial downturn Japan had experienced since the Korean War led to widespread hand-wringing and a heightened sense of the nation's vulnerability in an unpredictably and apparently hostile world. Well, as it turned out, though, Japan's economic recovery from the oil shocks was rapid and it was strong. The engine of Japanese resurgence was exports, and the destination of most of the automobiles, VCRs, and Sony Walkman that revived Japanese industry was the United States. U.S. consumers, though also reeling from the oil crisis, clamored for fuel-efficient Japanese cars, while buyers worldwide came to appreciate the high-quality, sophisticated design, and good prices of Japanese electronics. In 1974, Japanese-U.S. trade was more or less in balance. By 1976, America's trade deficit with Japan was about $4 billion. By 1978, $10 billion. And by 1985, more than $40 billion. The annual growth rate of Japan's national income slowed in the late 1970s from the heady heights of previous decades, yet hovered consistently at about 5%, a figure that was more than just respectable in an era of American stagflation and pallid global growth. Now, although Japan's economic rebound thus proceeded briskly, the political and social repercussions of the end of the high-growth era were more profound and long-lasting. The collapse of the miracle economy was accompanied by the demise of the society-wide consensus on economic growth as the overriding goal of national policy and personal ambition. In place of this unified commitment to industrial and financial development, a welter of new concerns, interests, and agendas rose to the surface of Japanese society in the 1970s. Mass protests and new social movements proliferated many of them expressing outrage, outrage at the long-overlooked costs of Japan's unfettered growth and the government's feeble response to mounting social and environmental problems. The oil shock and this rising chorus of discontent also took the shine off LDP political rule and the party faced declining electoral results from the 1960s 
although it managed tenaciously to cling on to power. The Liberal Democrats did belatedly embrace a range of progressive social welfare policies, but they continued to be seen by many Japanese as unresponsive, out of touch, and pervasively corrupt. Now, after the swirl of domestic and international tension in the 1970s, the 1980s proved to be exhilarating times indeed for Japan. As the Japanese economy surged forward, especially after 1985, the nation seemed headed toward global economic dominance. The Japanese, it seemed, were the wealthiest, best educated, and longest lived people in the world. Many commentators heralded the end of the Pax Americana and the start of the Pacific century, with Japan in the lead. As the Berlin Wall fell and the former superpowers took stock of almost half a century of furious military spending, pundits confidently declared that Japan had in fact won the Cold War. Enriched by an unprecedented stock market and real estate boom at home, Japan's corporations and financial titans went on a buying spree abroad. $80 million for a Van Gogh, $850 million for Rockefeller Center, $3 billion for Columbia Pictures, $900 million for the Pebble Beach Golf Course. Japan's banks were the largest in the world. Japanese manufacturers like Toyota were applauded and widely emulated for managerial innovations. The few moated acres of Tokyo's Imperial Palace, real estate experts concluded, were worth more than all the land in Canada combined. The 240 square miles of Tokyo were said to be worth more than all the land in the United States combined. The late 1980s were a dazzling and exuberant moment in Japanese history. To some, the extraordinary affluence of the time led to excess. Critics bemoaned the conspicuous consumption and luxurious lifestyles of the urban elite as well as the corrosive effects which such wealth was having on the values and expectations of Japanese youth. Social polarization also became an issue for the first time since the end of the war. Fortunes made overnight on the stock market or in real estate speculation meant that Japan was no longer the relatively egalitarian middle-class society of the high-growth era. Internationally, Japan's stature on the world stage seemed to rise as quickly as the skyscrapers being constructed in Tokyo. Even though Japan would be criticized during the first Gulf War of 1990 to 1991 for its checkbook diplomacy, contributing money rather than troops to the Allied cause, Japan's economic might and its generosity with aid funds in the developing world earned it increasing global clout. This unaccustomed international influence and the nation's mounting wealth seem to go to the heads of some Japanese commentators. In widely read books like The Japan That Can Say No from 1989, penned by Sony founder Morita Akio and conservative politician Ishihara Shintaro, opinion makers sought to celebrate Japan's cultural heritage champion a foreign policy independent of the United States, and stoke resurgent nationalist sentiments. Japan, it seemed, was on top of the world, and Morita and Ishihara were not alone in encouraging the Japanese to flaunt their nation's success. Now, as would only later become apparent, the prosperity of those charmed times was built only on the shakiest of financial foundations. In the wake of the Plaza Accords of 1985, under which the United States pressured Japan to correct its chronic trade surplus by strengthening the yen, the Bank of Japan pursued an expansionary monetary policy, which led to a speculative boom in real estate and equities, which gave rise to fierce competition in the banking sector, which in turn fueled reckless lending practices. This was exacerbated by changes in the corporate finance system. By the 1980s, 
Japanese corporations were growing too rapidly to finance all their capital needs from bank loans. So increasingly, firms like Toyota found their financing in the Tokyo bond market and in New York and London as well. This meant that Japan's big banks lost some of their biggest customers and were desperately looking for new places to invest their money. And this often ended up being with risky borrowers in questionable real estate deals. In short, the Japanese boom of the late 1980s was really little more than a financial house of cards, a false paradise of paper profits, or as it has come to be known, a bubble economy. And when the bust came and Japan's overinflated speculative bubble popped, the impact on Japanese politics, society, and culture, not to mention its economy, was little short of devastating. So let's step back now and ask one of those deceptively simple questions. How did the bubble get so bad? It's a question we're all asking ourselves now, I think, about our own homegrown financial crisis. So let's see if we can figure out what went wrong in Japan. Well, there are a few things uh, that economists uh, uh, have identified. First of all is inept management by the Bank of Japan. Uh, I think everyone agrees that the Bank of Japan uh, was not uh, on top of the bubble, that it got too large too quickly, uh, and that uh, some restraint uh, in monetary policy could have pulled Japan back from the brink. There still would have been a bubble, it still would have been bad, but it needn't have been so bad if the Bank of Japan had been a little bit more active uh, in trying uh, to deflate it uh, sooner. Then when they finally did deflate Japan, if they had brought the country down a little bit more gently rather than putting on the brakes quite as hard as they did, uh, it might have also led to a softer landing. So mistakes were made uh, by the Bank of Japan uh, in uh, allowing the bubble to get so big and then bringing it down. Exactly. So interest rates, they kept low for a very long time, even when it was clear that uh, real estate and equity prices no longer bore any resemblance uh, to reality. The growth was outstripping productivity and the economy very significantly. They kept pumping money in. Everyone has argued, almost all economists have argued, about a year earlier than they started to deflate the bubble, they should have been pulling back, and they should have been making money more expensive at that point to get a softer landing. Instead, what happened is they kept going until it reached a point that everyone said, this really isn't tenable. The market started to go down on its own. At that point, the Bank of Japan said, okay, we did let it go too far. Let's stop it. They threw on the brakes really hard. They really jacked up interest rates, uh, and that... Uh, added to the, to the crisis. So it really was a very ham-fisted approach to this. Of course, you know, looking backwards, everything is clear in retrospect. Uh, in those days, there were a lot of people saying, you know, Japan, it's going to keep growing like this forever. You know, we, we saw that in this country a few years ago. You know, when you're in the midst of one of these bubbles, you lose a sense of reality. But I think what everyone says is the people who are in the central bank shouldn't ever lose that sense of reality. Uh, and this was one of the problems that we saw in Japan. Uh, second point here is good old corruption. It turns out in Japan, and this probably shouldn't be surprising, when you hear about something like industrial policy and this very close relationship between uh, bureaucrats and business and bankers, uh, that regulators in Japan were not quite as independent as they could have been. Uh, that in fact, many bureaucrats, many of the people regulating the banking system uh, and uh, the stock market uh, were in the pocket of, or at least beholden to, bankers and brokers. Uh, and one mechanism for this in Japan, remember I mentioned earlier that the retirement age in Japan is generally 55. Well, when you're a bureaucrat in Japan, say in the Ministry of Finance, and you reach age 55, you're looking around for a good job. Bureaucrats aren't terribly well paid in Japan, so they want a really cushy, uh, uh, lucrative career after they retire. And if you're in the Ministry of Finance, that means you go work for one of the big Japanese banks. 
Okay? So what you have is a situation where bankers through much of their careers are, are, are angling to make good relationships in the banks so they can be hired in the banks when they retire. And then in turn, the banks are populated by former bureaucrats uh, who once were the regulators themselves and know all the ins and outs of the system. And what you got was an incredibly ingrown, inbred system where no real regulation uh, was taking place. What made this particularly nasty in the late 1980s um, was um, that uh, organized crime, the Japanese mob, Yakuza, became very involved, especially in real estate dealings uh, during this time. Uh, the mob traditionally has been involved uh, in more traditional uh, gangster activities like prostitution, drug dealing, loan sharking. Uh, but they realized in the late 1980s the real money was in property development. Uh, so they began to get very involved uh, in land speculation uh, and became very... Um, closely integrated uh, into some of Japan's uh, major banks. Uh, a number of Japanese banks were willing to turn a blind eye to this. Uh, they wanted to make money. They needed a new way to make money once they lost a number of their big corporate clients uh, for loans. Uh, and in any case, there was a long history of regulatory oversight so banks could get away with it uh, without uh, being terribly worried uh, about uh, the regulators, the government, or even their shareholders uh, coming down on them. As in this country, shareholders have traditionally had very little power uh, in Japanese corporations. So, so there really was no uh, supervision uh, from that uh, 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 angle either. Greed, okay, I don't think anything needs to be more said there, uh, especially in these bubble situations. People see money as easy. Money seems to beget money. Even if you don't have money, you can make money. Uh, this uh, defined Japan in the late 1980s, uh, that there always was an angle to be had. And finally, as I just briefly mentioned, one of the things that really contributed to the bubble getting out of control was this idea that Japan was different that Japan was a unique case, that Japan didn't have to follow the rules of neoclassical economics. Okay? Basically, almost everyone in Japan, and you know, I might almost say everyone, I remember this time, I can't remember anyone thinking that land would ever be a bad investment in Japan, that you would ever lose money on a land deal. Even as families were busily signing 120-year mortgages uh, because houses were so expensive, you couldn't possibly pay for them over one lifetime, so your kids had to pay for them too. Okay? Even during this craziness, people thought it's a good deal because land will just keep getting more valuable in our land-poor country. People also believed that uh, the Japanese economic experience since World War II showed that even when the global economy was at its worst during the oil shocks, the Japanese found a way to come back. And so they felt that they were somehow special. Okay? They bought in to the rhetoric of things like the Japan that can say no, that Japan had somehow transcended the rules of the economy and it created a system so perfect, okay, so different with all those special structures that it didn't need to worry about a bust. And then, of course, you, all, you get this irrational belief, as I'd mentioned, uh, that you get in every bubble economy that people believe it's going to go on forever, that things are so good you just keep rolling with the flow, uh, and that as long uh, as uh, nobody pays very close attention to the bottom line or to reality, uh, things keep uh, moving forward, that everything uh, uh, ends up being okay. Well, what happened then when the bubble burst? The peak was the last day of the 1980s. The last day of trading on the Nikkei Stock Exchange in 1989 was its historic peak. On that day, I think it was December 29th, 1989, the Nikkei index, which is the index for the Tokyo Stock Exchange, hit a record of over 30, 39,000. Within two years, it had withered to 14,000, and it bottomed out at 8,000 just over a decade later. So it lost approximately 80% of its value. 
Real estate prices traced a similar trajectory. In the early 1990s, over the span of just 30 months, Japanese investors and landowners saw $2.5 trillion in the value of their assets simply disappear. Commentators described the 1990s as Japan's age of vanishing wealth, when a generation's worth of capital creation could evaporate in only a matter of weeks. The crisis, which began in the financial and real estate markets, quickly sent shockwaves through the entire economy. The growth rate fell precipitously from 3.1% in 1991 to 0.4% in 1992 and 0.2% in 1993. In 1998 and 2001, Japan actually experienced negative growth. Corporations retrenched, pruning expenses, shedding redundant workers, and moving high-cost production overseas, especially to China and Southeast Asia, where labor costs were low. This led to swelling ranks of unemployed workers, something unheard of in Japan since the tough days of the occupation. The official unemployment rate topped 5.5% in 2003, though economists estimated that the actual rate was closer to 9%. The banking sector was especially hard hit by Japan's economic woes as financial institutions were saddled with a huge volume of uncollectible loans after the real estate bust, and the 1990s witnessed a disheartening series of bank failures, reorganizations, and mergers. And we can just, I just pulled a couple charts uh, off the web to give you a sense uh, graphically uh, of the extent. I mean, this shows pretty clearly uh, both the bubble and the bust, uh, pivoting right there on 1990. That's the Nikkei average. Here are real estate prices. Again, showing how uh, quickly they accelerated in the late 1990s and late 1980s, and how uh, rapidly they came down uh, uh, afterwards and have stayed down. There was a little bit of excitement. You might see right at the end here uh, that in 2006 to 2007, prices actually went up a tick uh, in the real estate market in Japan, and this was considered miraculous. And finally, here's uh, the Japanese GDP growth rate uh, that shows, I mean, this shows very nicely some of the last days here of the miracle economy, the oil crisis slump, the very strong comeback then in the 70s, the decent performance in the 80s. Uh, You can see there that the economy really didn't boom that much uh, during the bubble economy. It really was a financial and real estate. It was a speculative bubble uh, that didn't have that much effect uh, on GDP growth, but then it dragged the whole economy down with it. And since 1990, uh, you can see there, uh, the economy has been stagnant at best. Now, here are some sobering statistics. In comparative terms, Japan's economic stagnation has been startling. For example, Japan's share of world GDP peaked in 1991 at 9%. It is now predicted that in 2010, Japan's share of world GDP will shrink to only 6%. In terms of relative standards of living, in 1991, Japan's real per capita GDP had reached 90% of U.S. levels. By 2001, Japan had tumbled to 76% of the American benchmark. Japanese manufacturing, which had once been the pride of the economy, did not escape the downturn that began in finance and real estate. Burdened with excess capacity from an overly optimistic investment boom in the 1980s, industry has had to scramble to prune expenses, shed redundant workers, and move high-cost production overseas. Export industries like electronics, the automobile industry, and machinery continue to be relative bright spots in the overall economic picture for Japan, yet these extremely efficient, technologically sophisticated sectors make up only a small portion of the larger Japanese economy, and ironically are the sectors that have been the most aggressive in exporting jobs uh, in recent years. <clears throat> 
many firms and industries in Japan, particularly on the bottom half of the dual economy, so especially small manufacturers, the service sector, construction, distribution, and retailing, these smaller firms are generally not competitive by international standards, and their productivity often lags behind American benchmarks by 50% or more. So, for example, in single-family home construction, Japanese productivity is only about a third of U.S. levels, largely due to the lack of standardization. The vast majority of Japanese homes are still built using the traditional post and beam method where there can be up to 150 different dimensions of standard lumber, such as the 2 by 4 I mean, they have 150 uh, basic sizes of lumber in Japan. Such inefficiencies pervade the sheltered domestic sectors of the Japanese economy. Now, despite some reports to the contrary, especially what we see in the American media today, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go on, but I think if you read the American media today and you look at how the media is interpreting uh, the Japanese bubble and then the lost decade, uh, they pull any darn lesson they want out of the Japanese experience. If you want something, if you want to make a political point in America, you can find something in Jap Japan's recent history to help you prove your point. Uh, one of the things that's said most often in the American media today is that the Japanese government did nothing. The fact of the matter is the Japanese government did not simply stand back and fiddle as the economy burned. Indeed, over the past 20 years, the Japanese government has experimented with all the time-honored fiscal and monetary remedies to pull the economy out of recession. But for all the textbook solutions that Japan's politicians and bureaucrats have come up with, the Japanese economy has consistently proven itself stubbornly unresponsive. For instance, over the 1990s, the central government heartily embraced the Keynesian prescription for a slump, ramping up public work spending, and injecting waves of new money into the economy. Such fiscal stimulus did have short-term positive effects, but no matter how many new and usually unnecessary bridges, dams, and highways the government created, long-term economic revival remained elusive. What has made matters even worse is that Japan's Keynesian solution gone wrong has led to a staggering problem of national debt. After decades of chiding the United States for its fiscal irresponsibility, Japan has had to face an even more dire situation. Two decades of flat tax revenues and desperate pump-priming spending has left the Japanese government deeply in the red. Japan's gross national debt is now approximately 180% of its GDP, while its annual budget deficit is about 9% of GDP, and debt maintenance costs eat up around 12% of the central government's total annual expenditures. This level of indebtedness is, in relative terms, by all accounts, the highest in the industrial world today. All of the world's leading credit rating agencies downgraded Japan's sovereign debt ratings at the start of this decade, to the extent that Japanese government bonds have sometimes carried a lower rating than Botswana's. Not only is this humiliating for Japan, but such a staggering level of national debt is, over the long term, potentially very destabilizing for the international economy. Monetary policy, of course, has also been used in more or less conventional ways to try and rouse Japan from its economic funk. And this previous one, of course, you know, this just shows uh, the growth of the debt in Japan and the percentage uh, of uh, GDP. This next one uh, shows uh, interest rates uh, in Japan. But like uh, the expansionary fiscal policy, turning on the spigots of easy money to the to the extent that the Bank of Japan has regularly uh, pegged overnight interest rates at 0%. That is to say, it's offered free money uh, to any banks that want them. This uh, expansionary monetary policy has also failed to inject new life into the moribund Japanese economy. 
And while the low interest rate policy has allowed the government to manage, at least for the time being, the huge national debt burden, it has also caused tensions in other parts of the economy and society. Low interest rates, for example, have put considerable pressure on retirees, many of whom are dependent on interest income from savings accounts. Insurance companies and pension funds have also been squeezed. By 2001, six big insurers and more than 100 pension plans had gone belly up, unable to sustain a guaranteed 5 to 6% payout on the minuscule returns they were receiving on investments. <coughs> and some economists today still worry that all of Japan's private pension funds uh, are essentially bankrupt uh, and will not be able to honor uh, their obligations over the long term. Now that brings us unavoidably then to Japan's banking sector, long the most depressing part of the most depressing economy in the developed world. Even in the darkest days of the lost decade, Japan continued to claim several of the largest banks on the globe, at least on paper, yet analysts agreed that virtually all of Japan's banks were technically insolvent. Although a tangle of arcane accounting procedures and lenient government regulations kept them legally afloat. As recently as five years ago, independent observers placed the value of bad or dubious loans on the books of Japanese banks at 100 to 150 trillion yen. That is to say, about a trillion to a trillion and a half dollars. Such figures added up to 20 to 30 percent of Japanese GDP, which means quite simply that Japan's banking crisis was unprecedented among other major industrial nations. In the U.S. savings and loan debacle, by comparison, bad loans only totaled 5% of American GDP. And I'm not sure what the latest examples coming out of our current financial crisis are, but everything I've seen so far would still peg the, pig, the figure for America uh, over the past uh, few years lower as a percentage uh, of GDP than what Japan has been facing. So, what went wrong in the lost decade? Why weren't the bureaucrats or the politicians or the banks or Japan's industrial leaders able to get a handle on the nation's economic problems and turn things around? Now, needless to say, there's no simple answer to this question either. But let's consider a couple factors. First, as in the making of the bubble economy, government incompetence was a factor in the ongoing traumas of the lost decade. The Bank of Japan and the Ministry of Finance responded sluggishly at the start of the crisis, wishfully thinking that the economy would right itself and the financial problems were not as bad as they seemed. The government also behaved ham-fistedly when, in 1996, it jacked up the consumption tax in an attempt to get a handle on Japan's runaway budget deficits. So in 1996, the government raised consumption taxes from 3% to 5%. Japan at that point had been mounting a bit of an economic rally uh, thanks to uh, fiscal uh, spending, thanks to the easy monetary policy. But when that tax increase hit, it put an end to the recovery uh, uh, pronto. The other time when the Japanese economy has seemed to be picking up steam was from 2006 into 2008, when Japan essentially was being pulled along by the Chinese economic boom. Uh, Japan was growing during this time because of very high orders, especially for uh, machinery from China. Uh, however, this little mini recovery also ended badly as the American financial crisis has dragged the Japanese economy along with it. So that wasn't really the bureaucrats' fault. Now, the usual rap you hear in the American media is that the Japanese government did not act decisively enough to clean up the mess in the banking sector. They should have done what the Bush and Obama administrations have done and rapidly pumped huge amounts of public money into the banks to stabilize the situation, clear bad debt off the books, and keep the funds flowing into the financial system. Now, some of this criticism is truly on target. The Japanese were slow in addressing the bad debt issue, and they only really pumped 
uh, the funds necessary into banks to start clearing up their balance sheets after the start of the new millennium. Really, it was only about 2003 that the Japanese government uh, has done what we've been doing here over the past year, and that is to say really putting a lot of public money into banks to recapitalize them, to allow them to get those bad debts uh, off their balance sheets. So the Japanese went about a decade into their crisis before they did this. But excuse me, some Japanese bureaucrats have protested. We were just doing what many American economists and journalists were advising at the time. Let the market handle the problems in the financial system. Let the banks that can't make it fail. The system will adjust and the strong will survive. The government just needs to manage the downturn with classic fiscal and monetary policy, and things will work out. Flooding public money into the banks will just keep the market from operating efficiently. So these Japanese have said, typical American hypocrisy. You tell us one thing, we do it, it fails, and then you chide us for not doing more. And they really do have something when they say this. Because the American response to the Japanese financial crisis was, let the market work it out. Okay? Many American commentators say, you in Japan, you always want the government to fix things. Well, let the market do it. The Japanese did that for a decade. It was a mess. Then they stepped in, and the government began to work things out. Japan's political leaders deserve a good deal of the blame for the morass of the lost decade. The Liberal Democratic Party, rocked by scandal, internally fragmented, and vacillating on recovery policy, finally imploded in 1993, losing hold of the prime ministership for the first time since 1955, and ushering in a period of political instability just when Japan needed a firm hand on the ship of state. Even though the LDP was able to limp back into power after two and a half years, the political terrain was profoundly altered and for many Japanese, disturbingly volatile. Between 1989 and 2001, so in that span of about 12 years, Japan had 11 different prime ministers for an average term in office of just over a year. I use this uh, slide in class and the... Uh, caption I have in it for class is, would you buy a used car from one of these guys? These are the 11 prime ministers Japan had. It, it, it's a good quiz for a Japanese person just to try and identify. If you can get a majority of these guys, you're doing pretty well. Several departed under the cloud of scandal. One died in office. One lasted only two months in the job. Two of the most uh, avowedly uh, self-proclaimed reformers saw their administrations collapse in disgrace and failure. And one, uh, the inept Mori Yoshiro, saw his job approval rating amongst the Japanese public plunge to a pathetic 8%, possibly the lowest popularity ever commanded by the leader of a major industrial democracy. This was recently uh, 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 reached yet again. Another Japanese prime minister was in single-digit approval ratings. Um, and so uh, the uh, poor leadership continues. Even Japan's most effective prime minister of the past 20 years, and very possibly the only person in this rogues gallery recognizable uh, uh, still to someone outside Japan, on the lower left-hand side here, Koizumi Junichiro, could not deliver even a fraction of his grand promises and ambitious plans when it came to the reform of the Japanese political and economic status quo. Another problem in the lost decade was that some of the structural peculiarities of the Japanese economic system, which were so well designed to deliver high growth, Okay, which worked so well in the 50s and 60s, proved incredibly inflexible, confining, and burdensome in a time of economic stagnation. Thus, the system of permanent employment and the seniority system made it hard for companies to adjust efficiently to declining demand. 
while the cozy relationships between banks and sister firms in Keiretsu meant that loans continued to be provided to affiliated corporations, even if those corporations were not viable or even close to solvent. There were a lot of zombie companies uh, in Japan in the 1990s that because of banks' historic relationship uh, with them, they'd continue to give them loans, but the banks were essentially doing no business uh, and were just uh, surviving uh, on paper. So these structural peculiarities of the Japanese economy became a drag on the system. In a time of crisis, as we see in America today, the knee-jerk reaction is, got to save. Don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, got to keep more money. So the savings rate in Japan at the beginning of the lost decade, savings rate has always been very high in Japan, went even higher. People hoarded their money. In many cases, they pulled it out of commercial banks because they thought these commercial banks were unstable. And this actually made the situation worse for the banks because their deposit levels were going down. People instead chose to put their money either into their mattresses, and you know, this is an image that's often used in the media, but it's actually true in Japan. People in Japan were hoarding huge amounts of cash in their homes. The government had to print more physical money because so many people were taking it out of banks and just hiding it uh, in their homes. Or else they put it in what were the safest financial institutions, which were the government financial institutions. So the post office is the biggest financial institution in Japan. Post office savings has more deposits than any bank in Japan. And during the worst times in the last decade, people simply put their money in the post office. This essentially was facilitating the government's fiscal policy because this gave the government more money to go out and spend on useless highways and bridges and dams and so forth. And so this very bad circle uh, emerged. And as the Japanese people were squirreling their money away, the one thing they were not doing was spending. Okay? Consumption went way, way down uh, in the last decade. And the one thing that all economists, and particularly American economists, were saying was the only way for the Japanese to get out of this is to spend money and grow the economy from the inside. But no matter what the Japanese state did, the Japanese sat on their wallets. And every time it looked like there was a little bit of a boom in consumption, it just turns out that it was a more or less cyclical effect that after a certain amount of time, you know, after eight or ten years, people need to buy new refrigerators and washing machines and cars. People would buy them, the economy would look better, then they'd get them restocked again, and consumption would go right back down again. So, in other words, private sector consumption, which looked like it could be the rescue for the Japanese economy, never came through. The other thing that the Japanese public didn't do, even in the darkest days of the lost decade, was to really stand up for change. Over the past two decades, the Japanese people have been impassive in the face of economic hardship. They have been patient, resilient, and resigned in the face of lackluster political leadership, falling standards of living, and growing uncertainty. Many people have simply withdrawn from the democratic process, as voting statistics suggest. Many of those who are still engaged purport a yearning for reform, yet seem to have very little stomach for actual sacrifice. Perhaps this is the fault of politicians who have failed to articulate a clear vision. Perhaps it's the fault of a media that is often a poor defender of the public interest in Japan. Perhaps it's the fault of a history of tremendous administrative privilege and little opportunity for democratic expression. One might also argue that the Japanese public has gotten the political leadership and the national economic policy which it deserves. That because they have not demanded more, they haven't gotten more. And you certainly see this in Japan today. Traveling around the world, there are very few countries that I have found where you can't get a cab driver to talk about politics. In Japan today, cab drivers could care less about politics. Most people could care less about politics. They have given up on their elected leaders as people who can solve their problems. And this does not bode well for the future. Now let me sidetrack myself just for a moment here to very briefly mention the social fallout from the lost decade, because this, I think, uh, is uh, very important and very uh, uh, easy to talk about in the classroom. While Japan's long recession has clearly been catastrophic economically, 
Some would argue it has been equally, if not more, disastrous for Japanese society. In the 1990s, Japan, which for so long had seemed immune to social ills common in the industrial West, suddenly was beset by unfamiliar and tenacious problems. Suicide rates, historically relatively high in Japan, soared after the bursting of the bubble. As personal bankruptcies hit new peaks, layoffs, especially of middle-aged workers, overwhelmed families, and youth faced narrowed opportunities. Education, the traditional path to personal advancement, no longer seemed to guarantee success, and increasing numbers of young people grew alienated and cynical. Analysts gloomily predicted the collapse of the Japanese family as divorce rates increased, delinquency spiked, and the media overflowed with disturbing reports of schoolyard murderers and teenage prostitutes. 1995 was a particularly trying year. As the doomsday cult Om Shinrikyo released deadly sarin gas on the Tokyo subway, revealing the depths of discontent in Japanese society, and an earthquake killed 6,400 in and around Kobe, underlining the government's limited capacity for responding to disaster. Amidst the economic, political, and social crises of the 1990s, even basic questions of national identity, what defines being Japanese, seem distressingly fluid. As the fundamental truths of post-war Japanese life, the passion for economic growth, the trust in elected and bureaucratic elites, the faith in bedrock social institutions like the family appeared to crumble, many wondered if Japan would ever again be fired by a sense of national purpose or united by a sense of common identity. The past 20 years have in many ways shaken Japan to its very core. The Ohm Shinrikyo and Kobe incidents were really defining events in this process. The sense of profound lacking in Japanese society was revealed by Ohm. What was striking to people was, in Japan, the traditional feeling has been that cults appealed to the losers in society. People who were on the margins of society flocked to these new religious groups. Ohm, as you may remember, was populated largely by members of the elite, university-trained scientists, Graduates of Tokyo University, professional biochemists, professors were members of OM. It showed how disaffected even the top members of society were. Kobe then revealed that really the base institution of Japanese life, the state, couldn't be counted on in a time of crisis. The government's slow and ineffective response to that disaster really made many Japanese people feel like they were in it themselves. Really, we see in the 1990s a national sense of helplessness evolving. Most recently, other social crises in Japan, especially related to youth, have been grabbing headlines. I mentioned schoolyard murders. Some of you may remember these. The most famous was in 1997, where a 14-year-old in Kobe uh, beheaded an 11-year-old uh, at his school. This led to a string of copycat crimes uh, and other violence in its wake. Uh, another issue was teenage prostitution, what's known as Enjo Kosai. Uh, this became a real um, media frenzy <clears throat> when it was revealed a number of teenage Japanese girls uh, were working as prostitutes, uh, uh, undertaking compensated dating, as it was euphemistically, euphemistically called with middle-aged businessmen. Also worth noting is the current phenomenon of hikikomori, which is uh, translated sort of uh, technically as acute social withdrawal. Hikikomori are uh, young Japanese who no longer can deal uh, with interacting with the outside world, who withdraw uh, into their homes and generally into their rooms and do not leave them for years at a time. Uh, some estimates say there are as many as one million of these young people in Japan uh, who choose to take themselves out of society, who have no job, who do not attend school, uh, and uh, who choose not to have social contacts. They're generally facilitated by their parents, um, who will provide them uh, with a place to live and with nourishment, uh, but otherwise uh, they live entirely through uh, the Internet uh, and entirely solitary lives. This is related to the uh, 
issue uh, of Toko Kyohi, which is school refusal, which has been a major issue in Japan for about the past 10 years, where school children of all ages, as young as kindergarten, tell their parents they simply will not go to school anymore. They don't want to go to school. Okay? This has led to a profound crisis in Japanese society because school has and is generally conceived to be the major engine of socialization in Japan. And if you do not participate in school life, uh, you really can't participate actively in Japanese uh, society. This whole issue of alienation and frustration in Japanese, I think, for which all these uh, phenomena are uh, uh, related, uh, has been a really ongoing theme since 1989 uh, and have really, uh, has really uh, troubled Japanese society to the core. Because, of course, in a society like Japan, which is traditionally very group-oriented, there is nothing more uh, rebellious than saying, I'm not dealing with the group. I'm going to be a loner. I'm going to stay in my room. Don't bother me. Okay? This, in many ways, is the biggest middle finger youth can show society in Japan. We should also at this point note uh, the growing time bomb in Japan, which is what the Japanese call the graying of society. That is to say, the aging of Japanese society. Japan's working population, as you probably know, is shrinking steadily, and the number of adults in the workforce is expected to decline over 13% by 2025. The ratio of people 65 and over, which was about 20% in 2005, is predicted to rise to 30% by 2030. Increased immigration could neutralize the impact of this mounting demographic crisis, but the UN has estimated that Japan would have to absorb 700,000 new immigrants a year for the next 50 years to fully offset the shrinking of its own workforce. And this is inconceivable in Japan, which has never been particularly welcoming towards uh, outside workers. And in fact, the one group which the Japanese did actively invite into their country, that is to say the Brazilian Japanese, are now, if you've been watching the New York Times, being asked by the Japanese government, rather politely, to please go home and not come back. Uh, in fact, the Japanese government will now buy one-way plane tickets back to Brazil for any of these Brazilian Japanese who would like uh, to, go, uh, to go home. In any case, the future in this graph gives you a sense of it, seems to hold fewer workers and far more retirees for Japan, a scenario which threatens to depress economic growth, severely tax public and private pension systems, and send medical expenses soaring. So in a nutshell, then, the past 20 years have been a time of soul-searching for Japan, but so far without any satisfying answers or even bright ideas about how the nation might regenerate a sense of purpose and strengthen those core institutions which seem to have suffered so much since the end of the bubble economy. Finally, then, one last question. What lessons should we, standing now in the financial rubble of our own burst bubble, take from the Japanese experience? Here is my short and idiosyncratic list. And if you want to discuss this further, we can do it in question time. Greed is universal. Hindsight is 2020. The market can't solve everything. The government can't solve everything. Quick fixes probably won't fix it. Watch out for the social fallout from economic distress. And sobering though it may be, Not all stories have happy endings. That certainly is the case with the Japanese miracle. Thank you very much. I would be pleased to take questions, comments, condemnations, etc. What happened to the 125-year mortgages? What what happened to the multi-generation mortgages? They're still going. You know, the Japanese, it's interesting. You know, uh, even if uh, the Japanese financial system uh, has played it loose and easy with money for a long time, 
individual Japanese people take these things very seriously. And even though almost everyone who got one of those 125-year mortgages is now what we call underwater, uh, they're still honoring them. Uh, and there hasn't been the kind of effort from the Japanese government to renegotiate mortgages in the residential sector, which we've seen in this country, uh, because there still is that fundamental belief. A lot of these families with those mortgages still think it's going to be a good deal one of these days. Because there's so little land in this country, we're still going to get our money out of it. But, you know, if you're going to wait a century for it to happen, it's pretty pathetic. But it's a really good point. That, that sort of consumer market in Japan has not had the same impact on the government uh, in thinking of solutions to the financial crisis, which we see in this country. There was never really that discourse of how are we going to help all the individual people who've suffered from the banks pushing these uh, mortgages on them. Instead, it was looking at that sort of macro level. And that shows that there's just a low, low uh, uh, kind of uh, emphasis given uh, to the populace by the political leadership. Uh, you mentioned the aging population towards the end. Do you think demographics might have played a role in the, the boom and the stagnation? Was there initially a very young population that was coming into the job market and now you have an older yeah. population? Yeah, you know, I, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a difficult one to answer uh, because uh, clearly one of the issues about low consumption in the course of the 1980s was that uh, if you look at sort of uh, age demographics in Japan, essentially once you're 40 in Japan, you're not buying anything. Uh, it's young people who are buying everything. Uh, and as that group has shrunk, uh, the, consumption, the, the consumer economy has shrunk uh, as well. And this says really bad things about the future. If we're waiting for Japanese consumers to pull the economy out of their current funk, it's never going to happen. It simply isn't going to happen uh, because the uh, older people in Japan don't consume. That being said, what young people there are in Japan make up for that in very good ways. Uh, especially, uh, we see this phenomenon it really began in the late 1980s where people started talking about parasite singles uh, in Japan. Some of you may have heard this term. Parasite singles are young women who refuse to get married, who continue to work in sort of dead-end jobs and live at home with their parents. What this means is they get the most expensive thing in Japanese life, that is to say housing, paid for by their parents, and they can use all of their income, terrible as it though, though it may be, on consumption. Uh, and this has caused uh, something of a moral crisis in Japanese society because it worries the older generation because these women are independent, because they're using their economic might to consume, because they're not getting married, they're not having children. Uh, all of those traditional uh, expectations of women are being upset in Japanese society, and yet the government actually loves them because <laughs> they're some of the few people who are spending cash. And the government is actually caught in a tough situation uh, with women right now. Because on the one hand, the government is very strongly trying to encourage women to stay at home and have children. And yet the birth rate in Japan continues to go lower. The age at first marriage for women continues to go higher. Women aren't getting it. But the government, at the same time that they're telling women you need to have more children, are also saying to women, because the uh, country is aging and the workforce is getting smaller, we need you to continue in your careers. We need you to actually work. And so they're being pulled the same way women in this country have traditionally been, that the government is saying, we need you to have a career, we need you to be in the workforce, but we need you to be a mother at the same time. Uh, and Japanese women are not used to having to make this choice or make that balance. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the readings we read uh, <laughs> for the first day was uh, called The Quiet Coup, and it, it posits that there are oligarchs in American um, financial establishment that have a connection with government. And I see a connection with a kind of a similarity with, with, with uh, Japanese um, society, but I see some really important differences too. Um, I mean, to what extent do you see too, too much of a marriage between the business world and, and politics, you know, buying, you know, lobbyists and buying clout, et yeah. cetera, et cetera. That, yeah. That's part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, to me the problem in the Japanese case, and this might be the case in our society as well, is there is no countervailing force. You know, there was no one else, there was no, no organized group to present an alternate vision of how things could be done or to provide some kind of checks and balances on those relationships that were in place. 
you know, for so long it didn't seem like there needed to be. When the economy is growing constantly, you know, anybody in business is a genius, right? And, and I think that we've seen this in this country as well. You know, people look like geniuses until the bus comes, then everyone looks like a moron. Uh, uh, and this happened in Japan uh, as well, that for a long time people felt, as long as this bicycle keeps going, we don't need to worry. It's only when the bicycle falls over that people said, we should have been thinking about the training wheels about five miles back. Uh, and so it's a tough lesson for us all to learn. The challenge is going to be how this affects the road ahead. I don't think we've seen a situation in Japan where people have really learned from this, where we see new structures being put in place that are going to guarantee that something like this can't happen again. Because the entire discourse has changed from let's keep the bicycle moving forward to, oh, please, let's just set the bicycle upright, people aren't worried still about that kind of oligarchic uh, decision-making process uh, uh, tying together the business and political worlds. Everyone is so concerned about just getting the economy started, I think they'd be happy uh, uh, to see uh, uh, you know, this collusion happen if it worked again. So. Hi. Thanks. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Awesome. I have a question arising out of uh, your dialogue in regards to Japanese exporting certain job sectors or yep. markets. Yep. At a time when you want spending, why would you send employment opportunities and income opportunities out of the country when you could keep it in the country and build autonomy because people who have jobs do have to expend to get two jobs from jobs. They must eat, they must live. So it would have generated an opportunity for turning the autonomy around. Why did they export the jobs? You're so right. You know, that's the darn problem of the global economy. You know, and, and the fact simply that uh, jobs in Japan were and continue to be much more expensive uh, than they are in uh, Southeast Asia or particularly uh, in China. Uh, and for uh, the corporations that were making these decisions, for the Toyotas and Nissans and so forth, they were looking at their bottom line. They were not looking at the good of Japan because today, as we all know, is Toyota a Japanese corporation anymore? Well, technically, yes, but really it's a global corporation. Uh, and so its loyalty is not uh, to uh, the Japanese economy and doing what's best for Japan. Its loyalty is to doing what's best for Toyota. And what is doing what's best for Toyota in the 1990s, the new millennium, meant more plants in the U.S. South, more plants in China, and less opportunities for Japanese workers. At a certain point, though, and this, I think I was in Japan, this is when I was in Japan maybe three or four years ago. At that point, there was, it was a, an interesting moment because I heard from a number of people in Japanese business that at that point, it was getting very close again to making it possible to bring jobs back to Japan. The Japanese workers were just productive enough and that actually incomes had fallen enough in Japan that production in Japan was very close to production in China. And that, in fact, it was sort of a wash. Uh, and that companies could think about moving jobs back. And a few did. Amazingly, a number of Japanese firms that had started up operations in China and didn't like the quality they were getting out of Chinese workers brought them back to Japan at that point. So there was a bit of that. But I think even in those cases, this idea of what's good for the nation, that really didn't enter into the equation uh, because it was what's good for this particular firm or for capital. Exactly, exactly. A question up here? Thank you. Thanks. Um, you mentioned the Japanese corporate man who would, through the years, be promoted yep. and uh, promotions based on seniority and all that. Uh, well, with the economy the way it is, I read something about um, many of these men getting up in the morning and getting dressed and taking their briefcases and getting on the subway and going, yeah. riding the subway all day, yeah. or God knows what they did, yep. but, uh, but they didn't go to work. They were yep. too ashamed. So I was wondering, I think you said 5.5% of uh, un unemployment currently. Yeah. And so I was wondering what the demographics are and in what industries especially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you'll, you've seen in Japan, as in this country, uh, a real explosion in the service industry. So there are a lot of low-paying service jobs available in Japan. 
there are not many of those traditional good jobs, the sort of lifetime employment for university trained uh, uh, males in particular. And what one sees is a lot of middle-aged people uh, unemployed. Uh, and uh, in particular, one sees a lot of people who've reached retirement age at 55 who then cannot get a retirement job, which would be traditional. Usually when you got to 55, you'd leave your big company like Toyota and go work for one of its suppliers. Now those jobs aren't available, so people are losing their jobs for good at age 55, and they don't really have the financial resources to carry on. That phenomenon you mentioned of uh, workers who've been laid off being too ashamed to admit to their families or their communities that they've been laid off. So they get dressed every morning, they pack their briefcase, you know, sometimes fill, put the phone book in their briefcase, carry it off, get on the train, either go sit in a park, go sit in a mall, ride around all day. Uh, there have been several movies made in Japan about this phenomenon because it is said to be very common. Uh, uh, I personally have not seen these folks, uh, but I would... I would be interested. Uh, and th there's a name for them which I can't remember right now, with these sort of, uh, sort of migratory unemployed executives uh, who just can't get their minds around the fact they don't have a job anymore, can't admit to their community. Those, those uh, agreements, those mortgages are specially uh, arranged so that uh, the children do have to sign off on them. Uh, well, so the children th sign that's off. That's it. So you have multiple generations signing off on this. They have to sign off. If yep. the father bought the house and died yep. without the kids on it, yep. uh, would then, the kids then that would be, follow the same kind of uh, system as in this country. Oh, so they don't inherit their parents' no. debt? No, no. This isn't so much a question, it's just a comment. I spent some time in Tokyo in 2007 and was um, astonished at how the, the districts all evolve around shopping. Shibuya, Takeshita Dori, Shinjuku. I was just amazed at the consumer culture and the fact that it seems like there's a lot of money flowing. Um, I know you mentioned that that was the youth, if you could just yeah. say a little bit more about that. It didn't seem like anything was closing. Yeah, I mean, I think Tokyo is a really interesting case that Tokyo really still remains kind of a never-never land uh, in Japan where you don't see the economy suffering like you do other places in Japan. Uh, and mainly it's because Tokyo does attract those bright young things, the people with money who are always consuming. And a lot of what you describe, especially a place like Shibuya, that's designed for people 25 years old uh, and younger with lots of money in their pockets from their jobs, still living at home and their parents who are conspicuous consumers. The key is if you go out into the countryside uh, in Japan, it's like going to rural Kansas. Uh, it's actually quite scary. Rural Japan is depopulating rapidly. Even provincial cities, uh, you know, you, you drive down the main streets of some Japanese provincial cities, you feel like you're in Salina, Kansas, uh, where everything is, is boarded up and there just isn't that much activity left. What shocked me is I went last year to Kyoto, uh, which is, you know, the traditional imperial capital. In Tokyo, you never see an open shop. No matter where you go in Tokyo, there's never, there's always somebody selling something. Boy, in uh, downtown Kyoto, there are a lot of empty storefronts. Uh, and, you know, it surprised me that even in a very large city like that, a city that's done pretty well because Nintendo's based there, so it still has a good industrial base, uh, has, uh, has been suffering significantly in terms of retail. Yeah. I think we'll be able to take one more question. Okay. Would you be willing to draw any parallels between the Japanese situation and the situation currently in the United States? You know, uh, th there are a lot of parallels uh, in terms of the basic situation of the bubble, uh, I think. In many ways, uh, the parallels are, are, are pretty obvious there. Uh, what has differed is the American government has responded very differently so far from how the Dap Japanese did. So what we're going to see are two case studies. Uh, what happens uh, when a government sits back and allows the market to do it, takes a typical Keynesian response to something, and we see the American response, which has uh, been based on the fact that this Japanese uh, solution didn't seem to work, where the government jumps in feet first uh, and uh, begins to essentially nationalize financial institutions, pump government money into the banks, uh, and seek to bail out individual uh, debtors. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, it certainly uh, provides a contrast. Whether it's going to work, who knows? 
I probably wouldn't be standing here if I had the answer to that. <laughs> It's a good question. I'm not sure I'd be in Washington either. They might not want to hear. <laughs> no, but I think, uh, you know, I think the one thing, and, you know, this, this, this slide, I think, you know, I, I meant it to be a little bit provocatively negative, um, but uh, I do think what we need to be ready for in this country is a long experience of suffering. Uh, and a long experience of sacrifice. I think we're still in that same phase the Japanese were in the early 1990s where they thought things might get better soon. And then one day you wake up and say, man, it's been a decade and things haven't gotten better. This is a new reality. So the real test is then how do we adjust to that new reality?